Hi, my little guinea pigs. Today, we will experiment with the Auric Atmos. So, this Auric Atmos has been made by a small company called Tangerine, and it was pretty obscure as, as a computer, and, um, but it was pretty popular in France. I had a friend who had, who had one. So, let's discover this platform together. Uh, but first, let's get this one that I bought uh, in an unknown commission from eBay. The first thing I usually do when I buy a computer like this is just opening it up and see how it looks like. So I see like a 6502, that's cool. There is this weird button that is, I don't know, uh, something we will uh, look after. So first I need to be able to connect it to a video output somehow. And I found this cable on, on, a, on a website, right? So, and a recipe to make it. So I was like, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's do this, right? So I took um, a proto board, uh, an old cable that didn't work from an Amiga. And I had actually an LS244, uh, right? But look, it was a 74 HCT I needed, not an LS. Damn it, I didn't have any um, spare parts for this one, but uh, I was pretty proud of my proto board. So I changed my mind and I looked at the um, RF output and I realized that it was the same one as the ZX Spectrum. And on the web, you have actually some recipes to make composite video output out of those uh, ZX Spectrum. So I decided to do the same thing. And for those, this one, I knew I had the parts because I didn't want on, on the ZX80. So first a transistor and then a resistor. That's all you need to do this. Then you need to spot which one is the five volt and which one is the ground and uh, yeah i'm lazy so uh, i'm just getting a, a component tester to know which leads are which on the on the transistor you need an npm so you need to reuse the connector so i put a wire through the RF modulator, right? I disconnected the, the center pin and I just get the center pin out of the little metal box. And then I just solder. So it's a little bit finicky, but uh, yeah. I prefer to do that cleanly and have it well integrated to the, to the machine. Okay, once it's done, I prepare the transistor, putting some um, isolation around the, the leads. And then I prepare the three soldering points. And then I put the transistor on those three points. Then you need the resistor between the first leg and the ground. I just decided to, to just pinch it with the, the box for the ground. It should be enough. And then I just solder it to, directly to the, to the output. Okay, now we need power. So usually what I do is I make a little adapter for my bench power supply, so, it, so it's safe.
I start with like a very low current, like around the, exactly what it is expected to actually use. I put 0 0.6 amp, amps on. Then when, when I know it's safe, I can, uh, can actually uh, switch it on and it stays at 0 0.68 amps, which is perfect. So nothing is actually burning out or, or we didn't reverse a polarity or something. Then I check uh, the clock, uh, just to see on the 6502 if it is okay. Looks fine, it's a stable 1 uh, megahertz. Then before plugging this to anything, I prefer to check if the signal is okay, right? If I made a mistake, I don't want to inject like, like a 9 volt or something to, the, to my, uh, my converter. And it looks okay, it's like around like a 1 volt or something, so it's perfect. It should, looks like a, a video signal. I use this CAR2 HDMI uh, converter, very cheap one, but it does also composite with a little converter on top of it. And okay, switch it on, it doesn't look very good. Uh, the, the image is all garbled. So uh, the first thing I checked, and I think I got a good intuition here, you'll see later, is the reset pin. It looks like okay, the reset pin. So I just uh, check the, if there is no uh, shortcuts on the RAMs. I didn't sense anything. Uh, usually you can spot them like uh, pretty uh, easily with, with a finger. So I decided to try to piggyback some, uh, some RAM on top of the existing RAMs. It's a, it's a quick test to, be, to just check if uh, one RAM is obviously bad. And doing so, I realized that the patterns are changing when you add, uh, when you piggyback, piggyback RAMs like this. So I decided, okay, uh, let's, let's change them all with a stock of like brand new ones that I have. So first I need to put sockets in. So to make my job easier, uh, I just add some fresh solder on the, the existing pins, right? It helps with the soldering pump. And I go on and desolder all those solder joints. It took a while. Right, uh, there is still a little bit of solder on it, so to be sure I don't rip out any uh, of those uh, traces. I just heat up the board and heat up like slightly. Uh, I, I just aim at the, at the pins, right? And unsolder the components one by one. And then I clean up the remaining solder with my soldering pump. And it's time to put back all the sockets one by one. Put some tape to be sure they are like flush with the PCB and then tack them on the quickly with like uh, diagonal pins that I solder. I then solder them all and remove the flux with some isopropyl alcohol or I have also a PCB cleaner it works well. Then I take my new RAM, I bend back the pin in shape and uh, put all those RAMs on the sockets. Okay, let's try this, plug that back in. And nope, still the same thing. I noticed that the LS04 was defective, so I changed it, but it didn't improve the situation. Then I, I, I focused on the ROM itself, so I removed the ROM, tried to uh, 
be sure that the contacts are okay with the contact cleaner. Put that back in. It was still not working. So I decided to burn two EPROMs. I had only had the 64, uh, 27, uh, 64 ones. So I got back two sockets and removed the old one. And put new sockets for those two ones. Okay, so I burned them with a diag, right? So with two 2764. But when you look at the schematic, you need the, the IC11 that I added. But then I, for, I forgot actually the LK3, which needs to be open. And if you look at my picture, it was actually closed for the one chip configuration. So at that point, I just gave up. Uh, it was not working and um, trying to fix a machine without another uh, uh, reference machine is really hard. So I just ordered an Auric one. An Auric one is basically an Atmos, but the, um, the previous version. This one came with an RGB cable. That's nice because my, uh, my composite output was not really clean. And it came also with this Erebus uh, cartridge. It's, it's going to be cool to actually uh, try out things on the machine better. And also, we, it came with an English uh, power adapter. So, here is the Auric one. So you see that the, um, the keyboard was pretty crappy compared to the uh, Atmos, right? So that's the big improvement they made between the two versions. Otherwise, it looks pretty identical. So this is the cable that came with it. All right, so with the two machines, I could make some progress. So first, I realized that I had two problems at the same time. One is my new RAM was actually not good, like one third of the stock was bad. Uh, that's what you see on the left hand side. And the other issue was actually the reset. Um, trying to make this uh, Auric diagnostic that I could finally burn on, on um, 27.128 that I bought, I could not make it work until actually I resetted the 6502 manually. And suddenly I could see that the diagnostic ROM was telling me that the RAM was bad. I was really surprised with all my new RAM. Yeah, I, I, I went and, and randomly I, I flipped the, the RAM until it booted once. And um, from that on, I could make a lot of progress. So I went through my entire RAM stock to be sure that I tested them all. That was the first machine that where I used those um, those chips so I, I never knew if they were good or not so so that's a good practice to actually test them all and flag them as tested good to be sure to not fail in the same trap i, I went into with like two issues that are happening at the same time that's the worst thing when, when you are trying to troubleshoot a machine ram test passed so everything is good there the video output the cpu the ram i was pretty happy so started to test the other components between the two machines. So I flipped the ULA from one machine to another. Sure enough, the ULA also worked on the, on the, the other machine. And I could have actually tried, I actually tested the, the 6502 and the 22 on my uh, Commodore PET. They are the same chips. So that's why you see them already flagged uh, good. So the, the last thing I need to test is the ROM. So I tried the, the basic ROM 1.1, the recent one, and it booted up right out, out of the bat. So also, don't forget to flag them good so you never have a doubt about them. And finally, I tried the basic 
uh, 1.0, which was the original one from the Auric one. And it worked right away. So now, how can I fix this reset issue? I realized from the service manual from the Auric that it is a known problem on all the, those Auric's. And uh, there is a modification uh, that you can apply. Uh, first, you need to put a resistor between two legs on IC21. This one is pretty easy. And then you need to insert a resistor between those two pins. So that's a little bit more challenging. But hopefully I found that there is a little trace where, where the, the connection is going through on the top. So I cut between those two. I checked if the continuity is now open. And I basically reused those two VRs as pads for the resistor. So that was, that was pretty cool. It's pretty clean out of this. Yeah, I bend the, the legs along the, the traces to be sure they, they are not touching anything else. I scraped a little bit of uh, solder mask. I just soldered it. Okay, then I checked with the ohm meter that the from one point to another there is only this resistance in, in the middle. And sure enough, I just powered it up and it went through to basic without the need to actually reset it manually on the 6502. I was pretty happy, so I just put this Auric one back together. And then I tested the entire keyboard. It was working. So, okay, last step. I just wanted to clean it up a little bit. So here we go. Now we have a machine we can use to explore the Auric. But what about the other Atmos? I'll, uh, I'll check it out. I, I ordered some um, uh, logic chips that I'm missing, uh, but we can use the Auric one to start to explore this platform. So please stay tuned for the second part where we will do our traditional deep dive into this machine. I'm pretty curious about this chip, the sound chip, right? The AY36912. Please subscribe. In the second part, we will deep dive into what makes this platform very unique.